Welcome to a study of the readings assigned for this upcoming Sunday, which are from the second book of Maccabees, the Gospel of Luke, and Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that we can share your gospel, share your word, share the word that you have for each one of us through the study of your word. We thank you, Lord, that its truth will lead us and guide us and that it will help us walk closer to you. We thank you that the lesson will be meaningful for each one of us as we seek to do what you have us do in this life so that we can know that we will be with you forever as we when we leave this life. So we thank you for this lesson, and we receive it in thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. This coming Sunday is the 32nd Sunday in the liturgical season of Ordinary Time. And we'll study the readings chronologically with the first reading from the Old Testament from the book of Maccabees. Then study the New Testament reading from the Gospel of Luke, and finish our study with the second reading from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, and see how the readings relate to one another. Putting our readings in a time relationship on our timeline, this coming Sunday's first reading from the second book of Maccabees was written around 165 B.C. The Gospel reading from Luke takes place in 30 A.D., and Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians was written around 54 AD. Enlarging this section of the timeline, the books of Maccabees are included in the category of Bible books known as the Deuterocanonical books. The term Deuterocanonical meaning added later to the canon. The Jewish Bible and Protestant Bibles don't accept these books as part of their Bible, while Catholic and other denominations do. And they were written between the 400 years between the book of Malachi, the last book in both the Jewish Bible and the Protestant Old Testament, and before Jesus was born. Whether accepted as inspired by God or not, the books of Maccabees tells the history of the time period when the Maccabees revolted and successfully overthrew the Greek authorities during the Greek Empire. They were written in Greek, and they both record history of the same time period. The first book of Maccabees covers the period from 175 B.C. to 134 B.C., and the second book of Maccabees covers the time period 176 B.C. to 161 B.C. Even though they cover the same time period, they were written in different styles and have a different focus. It details the persecution of the Jewish people and the corruption of the Jewish leaders during this time period known as the Greek period. And it documents the overthrow of the Greeks in Israel by the Maccabees. So the Jews attribute their victory to God and the temple then is rededicated and Hanukkah is established at that time. Passage from the book helps us understand the corruption of the temple and office of the high priest as the Jewish people were ruled and influenced by the Greeks and Greek culture. 2 Maccabees 4, 13 through 15 gives us an understanding of what was happening at that time. Chapter 4, verse 13. There was such an extreme of Hellenization and increase in the adoption of foreign ways because of the surpassing wickedness of Jason, who was ungodly and no high priest, that the priests were no longer intent upon their service at the altar. Despising the sanctuary and neglecting the sacrifices, they hastened to take part in the unlawful proceedings in the wrestling arena after the call to the discus, disdaining the honors prized by their fathers and putting the highest value upon Greek forms of prestige. Well, Jason that's mentioned here, he was the high priest at the time. He was high priest from 175 to 171 BC. So this sets the stage here with a difficult situation that the Jewish people were in. Not only were they ruled by the Greeks, but they were also uh, adopting the Greek ways and the Greek uh, culture. 
And that's what the uh, high priests had done. And as it says here, they went along with the proceedings in the wrestling arena. They actually promoted the, the athletic events that the culture of Greek was all about and favored that more than th that of the original Jewish worship and how the Jews performed their ceremonies and worship in the temple. As it says at the end of verse 15, they put their highest value upon Greek forms of prestige. It says, and what wasn't unusual because, in, as we saw over the years leading up to this time, which is just before Jesus is born, that that's what would happen is that even though they were trying to stay pure in their worship to God and in their attention to the temple worship, they were would inevitably succumb to the influence of whoever was the dominant culture that had overtaken their land. So the Jewish people were in this situation where they lacked any godly Jewish leadership, as the corruption of the temple leaders showed and they were being persecuted by the Greek authorities at the same time. Sunday's first reading from the second book of Maccabees, chapter 7, starts at verse 1. It happened that seven brothers with their mother were arrested and tortured with whips and scourges by the king to force them to eat pork in violation of God's law. One of the brothers speaking for the others said, What do you expect to achieve by questioning us? We are ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our ancestors. At the point of death, he said, you accursed fiend, you are depriving us of this present life. But the king of the world will raise us up to live again forever. It is for his laws that we are dying. After him, the third suffered their cruel sport. He put out his tongue at once when told to do so and bravely held out his hands as he spoke these noble words. It was from heaven that I received these. For the sake of his laws, I disdain them. From him, I hope to receive them again. Even the king and his attendants marveled at the young man's courage because he regarded his suffering as nothing. After he had died, they tortured and maltreated the fourth brother in the same way. When he was near death, he said, It is my choice to die at the hands of men with the hope God gives of being raised up by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. Now, the rest of the chapter details how, as each of the brothers was tortured and nearing death, they professed their readiness to die rather than transgress the laws of their ancestors. Finally, the mother was killed as well. The key verse that captures what they believed in is verse 9. And it says in verse 9, the king of the world will raise us up to live again forever. So this is a stirring story that represents not only this family's dedication to God's word, but how believers can strengthen one another by giving each other strength to face the fiery darts of the devil, as Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians. This story also became inspirational for Jews who became Christians later on as they faced death when the Roman Empire banned Christianity and persecuted the Christian population. While Paul does not refer to this particular story in his letters, he offers the same kind of encouragement and support in our second reading this Sunday, which we will be studying shortly. Next is the Gospel reading. This is Sunday's Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 20 and starts at verse 27. We will begin at verse 1 to see what leads to the Gospel reading. Last week, chapter 19, told of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem along this road from Bethany into Jerusalem. As he rode on a donkey, he was hailed as the Messiah. Then he goes to the temple and drives out the merchants and money changers. During that week, from Palm Sunday, when he rode into Jerusalem, until the Feast of the Passover on Thursday, Jesus teaches in the temple. Chapter 20, verse 1, starts this way. One day, as he was teaching in the people in the temple area and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and scribes, together with the elders, approached him and said to him, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is the one who gave you this authority? He said to them in reply, 
I shall ask you a question. Tell me, was John's baptism of heavenly or of human origin? They discussed this among themselves and said, if we say of heavenly origin, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, then all the people will stone us. But they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know from where it came. And Jesus said to them, neither shall I tell you by what authority I do these things. So the temple leaders are confronting Jesus, asking with what authority he has to cast out the merchants, as they saw him do, as we saw in last week's gospel. And in Luke 19.45, it said he was doing these things, the things that he had been teaching and preaching. And so this is what they're questioning here. What authority do you have to do these things? They want to know where his diploma is. Where was he ordained? Again, Jesus knows their intent, so he answers them with a question. In verse 5, they rely on their discussion and reasoning to respond, not spiritual guidance. An interesting story that Ed Thomas Edison said, success is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. But without the inspiration, all you have is B.O. We can be doing stuff and not achieving anything God desires. We need to respond to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What does God want most? Hosea from the Old Testament tells us, chapter 6, verse 6, I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Verse 9, he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants and when, went to another country for a long time. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants in order that they might give him his share of the produce of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Next, he sent another slave. That one also they beat and insulted and sent away empty-handed. And he sent his still a third. This one also they wounded and threw out. Well, back then, tenant farming was common in Jesus' day. The land was leased to them, and they paid a portion back to the owner. This translation says he sent a slave. This shows how slaves were considered at that time, not like we perceive slavery how it was in this country. Other translations say servant in the place of this because servants were, the word servant is more accurate to how slaves were treated, even though they were considered slaves, it's more accurate concept than a slave. Plus they also had the opportunity to actually work off their slavery so they could become free. Many times the owners would set them free when they chose to. The parable here correlates to Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, where it describes the vineyard being the house of Israel, but contains oppression and corruption. In both Isaiah and here in Luke, shows that God is the owner. We are the tenants allowed to use his creation. One day we will answer for how we use it, just as these tenant farmers, we are the tenants of God's creation, and we will be called the task as to how we use it. Jesus uses the parable as a picture of the prophets and how they were treated with disdain and even killed. Verse 13, the parable goes on. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? So here in verse 13, God sends his son. That this is, this is what it's a parable of. We are the tenants of his creation. And by this, vein, this owner sending his son, his beloved son, that's what is a parable of God sending his son to the earth. And this particular par parable, in fact, verifies the fact that Jesus is God's son 
and that he sent him to this earth. And in verse 14, the tenant farmers assumed that the owner was dead since his son was coming. So they think that if they kill him, they can claim the vineyard because that was the common practice if the vineyard was farmed for three years and the owner had died. So that's what this alludes to here. Then the parable continues. The end of verse 15 says, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? What will God do to them? In our situation being this is a parable for us. Verse 16, he will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, heaven forbid. But he looked at them and said, what then does this text mean? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. So verse 16 is the prophecy that the heirs of the kingdom will be to Gentiles. As this verse says, it will go to others instead of just those that God has chosen as his people. It will go to the Gentiles. They will be the heirs of the kingdom. Verse 17, the stone that Jesus is talking about, the stone that the builders rejected, he is the stone. Represents Jesus. He is quoting Psalm 118, verse 22. Now, when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and needed water, he struck a rock. And when he struck that rock, water poured forth. That rock represented and symbolized the Messiah bringing forth water, living water. Then verse 18. Whoever comes to Christ is broken. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken. Whoever comes to Christ is broken. They are taking, taken out of the, their unrighteousness. They will have their righteousness seen as filthy rags, as we studied last week. And as a result, it also says, whoever rejects him will be destroyed. Verse 19, when the scribes and chief priests realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to lay hands on him at the very hour, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be honest in order to trap him by what he said, so as to hand him over to the jurisdiction and authority of the governor. So verse 19, they get what he's talking about, that he's talking about them. Isaiah 8, 14 and 28, 16 says, when the Messiah comes, he will be a stone of stumbling. To believers, he will be the chief cornerstone. So here now, they are ready to lay their hands on him and kill him. But once again, they're afraid of the popularity of Jesus. They're afraid of the people. And verse 20 says that they sent spies. They're spying on God, but they're also flattering him trying to trick him, but trying to trick God is a futile effort. Verse 21. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you are right in what you say and teach, and you show deference to no one, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose head and whose title does it bear? They said, the emperor's. He said to them, then give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. So verse 21 says, uh, shows us that public opinion has kept the Jewish leaders from stopping Jesus. They're now trying to turn public opinion against him by setting him up and trapping him with the question regarding payment of tribute, payment of taxes. The Jews hate the fact that they have to pay tribute to Rome. So if he says paying tribute is right to do, his followers will hate him. But if he says paying the taxes is not right, they can bring him before the civil authorities for being a revolutionary, telling the people not to pay taxes. So they're asking is, yes or is it no? 
Now, Jesus is not irritated if they ask sincere questions. He's against the insincerity of these asking such things. When people ask sincere questions, like the rich young ruler that we saw recently in the gospel, he answers sincerely to him. So what we need to see here is that in verse 22, the word pay is the original Greek word in the manuscript, the word didomai. Didomai means to give something that you own. In verse 25, the word give there is the Greek word apodidomai, meaning to give back to, to give back to Caesar. Money is the government's, not ours. We only have it to purchase things. So he says, give to Caesar what is his. He represents the government authority. So give back to him the money because that's his. But then Jesus says, give back to God, which you are indebted to him for. In fact, the word pay then in verse 22 can be translated the word give. Is it lawful for us to give to the emperor or not? And Jesus then modifies what they're asking to say, then give back to the emperor the things that are the emperor's. As it says in 1 Peter 2.17, fear God and honor the emperor. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven as well as citizens of the earth. So we need to understand that Jesus is telling us today then, honor the government by paying our taxes and to give to God the things that are God's. So verse 26 tells us how they responded. They were not able in the presence of the people to trap him by what he said. And being amazed by his answer, they became silent. Shows they were stumped and what to say next, trying to trap him. So they changed the subject in the next verses, which is what this, sun, this Sunday's reading is about. Verse 27. Some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, came forward and put this question to Jesus, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, if someone's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman but died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And likewise, all the seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. Now, at the resurrection, whose wife will that woman be? For all seven had been married to her. Jesus said to them, The children of this age marry and remarry. But those who are deemed worthy to attain to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die, for they are like angels. And they are the children of God because they are the ones who will rise. That the dead will rise, even Moses made known in the passage about the bush when he called out, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. And some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well but they no longer dared to ask him another question. So in verse 27, we know that the Sadducees disbelieved and even mocked the existence of angels, spirits, and immortality. They only believed what they can see. But they supposedly followed the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, within which angels are described. So how they could not believe what their own Scripture said it's hard to understand, but it says that the Sadducees deny there is a resurrection. Jesus is telling them that there will be a resurrection by explaining what happens during the resurrection. So what they have done is they actually renewed the corruption, which was evident during the period of the Maccabees, only 150 or so years before this time period. Verse 28, then, then this practice 
that's described here. If someone's brother dies, leaving a wife, but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. That was a practice described in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, which was established so that the inheritance would stay in the family, particularly the inheritance of the land. Verse 35, those who are deemed worthy to attain to the, uh, to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Those that are called worthy and to be among those resurrected from the dead are those who are saved. They are the believers in Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Messiah that God promised. So Jesus is explaining here that heaven is a different kind of existence than what we know here on earth. So in verse 36, where he says they can no longer die for they are like angels and they are the children of God because they are the ones who will rise. Those are the, those deemed worthy to attain the coming age. After this verse in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew and Mark, they add, you do not know the scriptures or the power of God, which, by the way, many Christians are guilty of today, let alone non-Christians. In verse 37 and 38, in Matthew and Mark, regarding this particular parable, Jesus says, God says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of the living, not the dead. God does not say, I was. He says, I am. They are alive, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are alive. They will be alive for eternity. They are alive now as they ever were. So here, as it says in the two verses that are not part of the reading this Sunday, they answered, you have spoken well. Well, they're just being sarcastic. They no longer dared to ask him another question. They're so stumped that they now won't even try to change the subject. They just stop asking him questions. Then the chapter continues, verse 41. Then he said to them, how can they say that the Messiah is David's son? David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? So here in verse 42, when he says, David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This is him quoting Psalm 110, verse 1, where David is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, this was unfathomable to them. How could David call the Messiah, who through human heritage, be David's descendant, also be acknowledged by David as his Lord at the same time? book of Revelation tells us that the Messiah is called the root of the offspring of David. M Messiah, Jesus, always existed. So he was always before David, was always his ancestor, but he was also his descendant. In the hearing of all the people, he said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love to be greeted with respect in marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Verses 46 and 47, beware of these things that the scribes like to do. He is telling them the religious leaders project a religious image, but God has no interest in that image. Now, chapter 20 shouldn't end here, even though that's the last verse of this chapter, but it continues for the next four verses, beginning four verses in Luke 21. So chapter 21, the first four verses are this. He looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. He said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. So even today, people give out of their abundance. It's what they have extra to be able to give. This widow puts in her life 
puts it in upon God. She is fully dedicated to God, not to be seen of men, but to be loved by God. God is interested in the condition of our heart toward the giving, not the amount that we give. He doesn't need our money. Giving is for our benefit, not for God's. She's not interested in the appearance. She's interested in the giving. Previously, the end of chapter 20 said that the religious leaders project a religious image, which God has no interest in that. This is what this also represents. And the copper coins, two small copper coins. Copper coins is the translated from the Greek word lepton. It literally means a tiny thing. Two copper coins equaled only 2% of a day's wages. But to her, it was a lot because that was all she had. And here too, we can understand that this widow is not blaming God for taking her husband, but committing her whole life to God. This ends chapter 20 and the first four verses of 21. Next week, we will study the remainder of chapter 21, which contains the gospel reading for the following Sunday. Second reading is from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. As we introduced the letter last week, Paul had founded the church in Thessalonica about 50 AD during his second missionary journey. Then he later wrote the letter to them around 54 AD. It's a letter of instruction to the Christian church and continues to be instruction for us today. Last week, we ended our study at chapter 2, verse 15. Sunday's second reading picks up at verse 16. Brothers and sisters, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting encouragement and good hope through his grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen them in every good deed and word. So here Paul includes this prayer that those who believe will find comfort in their hearts and receive strength to do what God has given them to do and to say. It's a prayer for us as well. Because we know this letter was circulated throughout all the churches. So it's not just for the Thessalonians, that it's also for all believers for all time. Then the reading continues in chapter 3 at verse 1. Finally, brothers and sisters, pray for us, so that the word of the Lord may speed forward and be glorified, as it did among you, and that we may be delivered from perverse and wicked people, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. We are confident of you in the Lord that what we instruct you, you are doing and will continue to do. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the endurance of Christ. So Paul is asking for prayer too. He needs prayer. He needs people to pray for him. Paul's intent ever since the Lord met him on the road to Damascus was to take the gospel as far and wide as he could and as quickly as possible. Time is the one commodity that can never be reclaimed, and our task is to spend it wisely for the glory of God. Paul acknowledges the evil people who lack faith in God. But then in verse 3, he says, Not only is the Lord faithful, but he will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. This is where Jesus gives the prayer that he that we call the Our Father, where it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It really means what Paul is saying here. Lead us not to be tempted into doing things we shouldn't do and deliver us from the evil one. Finally, Paul expresses his confidence that they, and by extension, we today, will continue to follow what he has taught and direct our hearts to the love of God and maintain our endurance through Christ. Next week, the second reading actually picks up right after this at verse 6 of chapter 3. So to summarize, I have no picture for the Maccabees here because the author is unknown, so we have no representations of who the author is of Maccabees. But to summarize the first reading and the gospel reading, we have accounts of seven brothers. But the stories are entirely different. The Old Testament story in 2 Maccabees tells of how the seven brothers and their mother 
were killed for following God's word instead of man's. They would not bow their knee to the pagan Greek authorities. The gospel reading from Luke tells of seven brothers who, after each died, married the same woman one after the other. Now, every time I think of this story, I think of you would think after uh, a couple of them died that she would uh, get the hint and uh, maybe not marry the next one <laughs> because she doesn't want to jinx them. But in any case, but what's happening there is that the temple leaders are trying to get Jesus to share what he thinks about heaven. So they ask Jesus, who will be the husband of the woman in heaven? And Jesus tells them that they totally misunderstand what heaven is like. Our understanding of how heaven operates is also woefully lacking because God and his spiritual realm are much more than we could ever imagine. And then Paul, in the second reading, instructs the Thessalonians to keep the faith, bear with and support one another, just as the seven brothers in the Old Testament reading did. And then Paul prays for us to keep up our commitment to Christ and devotion to his word. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, you give us so much to consider here, so much to understand, but so much is made clear. What's interesting, God, is we know that as we learn, the more we learn, the more we know we don't know. So we just thank you, Lord, that you've given us this little bit to know, this small part of understanding of you and your word and your realm and the universe that you've provided us to live in so that as we can live by what you teach us and live our lives according to your word and do what you've given us to do, that we can do it so that someday we'll be there with you in the expanse of the universe and understanding of it and the understanding of your spiritual realm will be made known to us in all of its glory. So we look forward to that day, and we thank you and praise you for this lesson. We receive it in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.